Good evening and welcome. I'm Corey Ajme, a proud committee member of UJA's Executive Sephardic Division. We help support the New York Jewish community as well as deepen our relationship with the Sephardic community around issues of communal concern. We are so pleased to partner this evening's discussion with the Center, SBH, and the SCA. Thank you for helping us promote the event for all that you do for the Sephardic community. We are here this evening for a follow-up visit from our doctors after last week's informative discussion. We hope this evening to have your questions answered with Dr. Salama and Stern, as well as Dr. Victor Grazi, who will be also be joining our panelists to answer your questions. Before we begin, I'd like to share with you why UJA is important to me. I'm always in awe with their bold response to crisis as they are uniquely positioned to provide so many resources to help so many. UJA's network of nonprofits, synagogues, and day schools is continuing to mobilize and adapt quickly to the evolving needs of the COVID-19 global pandemic. They've compiled resources to help the Jewish community navigate these uncharted waters, allocating $44 million to meet the tremendous needs in New York and Israel, focusing on the vulnerable, including food for homebound seniors, connecting with Holocaust survivors, interest-free loans for JCCs, as well as human service organizations. We're blessed that UJA is in our own backyard. With direct emergency support to the center, as well as, as, well as Sephardic Bohoholim, and provided technical support to our yeshivot and synagogues to assist in the complex application process to apply for SBA loans. They are always there for us and our community. Also, I wanted to share a short story about the deepening relationship with UJA and the Sephardic community. UJA received a call from one of their nearly 75 agencies that they support, Hebrew Free Burial Society, that they were running short on toilets for burials. As at this time last year, there were only 30 burials. Since January, FF, HFBS has given dignified burials to nearly 150 people. Within hours, the SCA donated 70 toilets, and within 24 hours, they were delivered to the cemetery. We are all in this together, and we are truly grateful. With regard to the Zoom, web to the Zoom webinar, we have muted our guests during the conversation. We are encouraging you to submit your questions via the chat function at the bottom of your screen, and our doctors will do their best to address them throughout the briefing. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Victor Grazi, who will, moder who will be moderating this evening's conversation. He is an assistant clinical professor at Mount Sinai in obstetrics and gynecology, as well as the former president of Sephardic Bokoholim. Let's turn our attention to Dr. Grazi. Welcome to our program. Uh, we met for the first time uh, via this webinar this past Wednesday night, and I'd like to do a quick recap of the material that we covered at that time for those of, the, of those of you who are unable to join us. Uh, we spoke about the coronavirus pandemic and means of transmission. We spoke primarily about those at greatest risk, namely those who are elderly or have what we call comorbidities or other medical conditions. We touched upon the different means of testing the pharyngeal swab, which is a nucleic acid test to test for the presence of the virus. We spoke about its limitations. We also spoke about a very important topic of antibody testing and discussed specifically the limitations in antibody testing and how we cannot at this point recommend that people use antibody testing as a means of eliminating their need to social distance. Finally, we spoke about uh, the need for people who have medical conditions, medical problems unrelated to COVID to be important. It's very important for them to remember to seek care. We're seeing a marked uh, diminution in the number of people presenting to our emergency rooms with very serious conditions like heart attacks and strokes. And our concern, which we believe is going to be borne out by the data, is that people are hesitant to come to the hospital for that reason. And we need to repeat a critical message to everybody to present for medical care, speak to your attending physicians if you have any medical concerns related or unrelated to COVID. We then moved on to talk about different treatment options. We focused upon the plasma donations. And as the session last week uh, coincided with the 
Um, first, promising results regarding Redemzivir, we spoke about that as well. What I'd like to do now, after having given you that brief recap of our last meeting, is move on to tonight's meeting. I'd like to once again welcome our two experts. Dr. Carlos Salama is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine and an attending in infectious disease at the Elmhurst Medical Center. Dr. Aaron Stern is an Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine Mount, uh, and Mount Sinai Medical Center. He is a nephrologist by training and has been dealing on a consistent daily basis in the intensive care units at Elmhurst with patients with COVID. Uh, so uh, I'd like to welcome you back and thank you again for taking the time to join us from your busy schedule. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that we didn't have much time to get to last time and we hope to focus on today is a more of a true question and answer uh, session where we were able to glean questions that we received both during the last session, and perhaps some we received tonight that are on people's minds. I'd like to point out to our audience that a lot of the questions that you've asked may not be raised by me or read by me verbatim, but a lot of the questions have a good degree of overlap. So please listen carefully to all the answers, even if the question doesn't sound familiar to you, because the answer we'll be providing may in fact be an answer to your question as well, even if it comes from a different text or a, diff a different source. So we talked at the first uh, visit, the first session about transmission. I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about what we call fomites. Namely, we know that the virus is primarily transmitted through sneezing, through coughing, through breathing, through the air. But we've been given some information. I'd like for you to elaborate on it, please. What's the risk of getting the virus from a tabletop, from a doorknob? How do we prevent that from happening if it is, in fact, a risk? And um, with most of the questions, I'll, lead it, I'll open it up to either of our panelists, either Dr. Stern, or Dr. Salam, whoever presses the button first wins the prize. <laughs> okay. Uh, Aaron, is, well, yeah, let, let me start with that. Um, so fomites have been a, uh, a puzzle with regards to COVID-19. There's definitely viral fomites on surfaces, there's no doubt about that. And it is likely a form of transmission but it just seems that if it was a very significant, a hugely significant form of transmission, that we would see far more um, uh, staff in hospitals being infected than the large numbers that there are. So that, you know, we, you know we're just not seeing a great deal of, of what we think is fomite transmission in the hospital. Having said that, I would recommend to, pre to prevent fomite transmission that you clean countertops, uh, you, you, you clean, uh, when you go shopping, you clean what you, what you bought, you use Lysol wipes to clean the outside of the plastic and the cans and everything that you buy. Um, I even wash, uh, a fruit and vegetables, anything that I can wash with warm soap and water, uh, in order to clean whatever may have been touched by somebody else. Uh, so I'm very careful. And I, and I think even though we don't know as much as we should about fomite transmission with COVID-19, it probably is an issue, maybe not as big of an issue as we thought it would have been maybe a month ago, but I'm still very careful and think everything should be thoroughly washed and that we should keep our surfaces clean. Right, and it goes without saying, of course, that doorknobs and light switches and, and faucets at home are areas you wanna focus on with in terms of cleaning and keeping them clean and wiping them down. And I, I would say one other thing um, with regards to toilets, you know, flushing a toilet uh, can cause whatever is in that toilet to become aerosolized. So we know that that uh, viruses shed uh, in stool. And so after one goes to the bathroom and flushes a toilet, if you, if you share a home or if you use public toilets, that is something to be a little concerned about. Uh, we don't know how that affects transmission, we just we may never know, but it's just something to think about when using public toilets. Any special precautions that should be taken if people have pets? I know there have been reports of certain animal species being infected with the virus. Do you know of any reports describing transmission to humans? Uh, I have not heard of reports uh, that uh, transmits to humans, but I wouldn't doubt that it's possible if the virus I mean, dogs love to lick their their uh, handlers' faces, and I wouldn't I wouldn't bet against it. Um, but you know that that's that's a very difficult situation. If you're a dog owner and you have an, if you have a dog who has COVID, you probably gave that dog COVID, or it may serve as a transmission in a home. But you know it it, it it's you know it's very hard to figure that one out. 
So we, we talked about surfaces and you talked about ideally washing off fruits and vegetables, etc. Cooked foods, concerns about cooked foods, should someone while cooking wear a mask? No. No, in general, heat will kill, generally kill most, enough of the virus that it really should not be a problem. So. Wonderful. Right. Okay. Um, in terms of testing, we did speak in the first session about not relying upon antibody testing as a means of, of using it as an exit strategy. Uh, some very interesting questions came in regarding the, the antibody testing. Um, one person asked, how is it possible for a married couple to be living together and for one to test positive and the other to test negative on an antibody screen? Well, the, as I mentioned last time, we, the antibody tests are not yet standardized and we just don't know how reliable they are. And so when we test different people, we may get different results. I will give you an example. Uh, one of the doctors who I work with, uh, who, who's in office next to me at work, he had COVID, pr COVID proven disease, meaning he had a swab that was an antigen test when he was sick and he tested positive. He then got the blood test that was being offered by another institution in our hospital and he got and he tested positive and he had a one to 960 titer, good titer. He then got another test that's being offered by another institution as part of a study in our hospital uh, a few days ago and he tested negative. So you can see there that between two different antibody tests on the same patient, someone we know had the disease tested positive to negative. This shows that we need to figure these tests out first before we use them widely in order to determine who is positive, who's negative, who transmit, who doesn't transmit. And furthermore, we have to make sure that people who are positive cannot get reinfected. So that is all. So with regards to a family, one of them may have been a false negative, another one, you know, may, maybe didn't get infected. It's, you know, people are different genetically and some people I'm sure genetically are more likely to be infected than others. So it's possible one was positive and one was truly negative. So there's a lot of possibilities there. Yeah, I think it's important when talking about testing that we reiterate a very important point from last, last meeting, namely, um, there are a lot of tests out there that are not, haven't been validated. The FDA uh, issued what they called an emergency use, use authorization in EUA where they didn't require the companies to necessarily go through the extensive vetting process. Uh, some of the companies have this emergency use authorization, but there are report, there are definitely many, many, many locations that are offering completely unverified testing. So if you're gonna have the testing done, we believe at this point uh, that it really should be done either as a public health measure for the local authorities to gain a sense for what the prevalence of the virus is in the community, or if you're interested in participating in a plasma donation program. Other than that, at this point, um, uh, I, I, I would like your affirmation that there really isn't very much value in an individual being tested, antibody-wise. I, I, I think that's correct because there's too many unanswered questions and it may give false hope or, or a sense of, oh my God, I thought I had it, I don't have it. So I, yeah, I think that's right. But I also think in terms of a timeline, the next, you know, in the next month, two months, we're gonna have, it's gonna be much clearer what in terms of going forward, which tests are good, which ones are reliable. And so every, every week brings us closer to sort of a, a consensus. And I think that's something that we can look forward to. We're kind of living in slow motion right now with this disease, right? We're, we're, every day gives us new information and it, it's kind of like a slow motion roll forward of what's happening. Whereas normally a month goes by, you hear more information. We get drips and grabs every day and it makes everyone a little uncomfortable. The, another question that came in regarding testing, if one has the nasal swab, which is the one looking for the presence or the absence of the virus as opposed to the antibody testing, just so our audience is clear, um, the question was, if I was tested this morning, received my results and I'm negative, for how long can I assume, if I can at all, that I'm not contagious? <laughs> That's the billion dollar well, question, isn't it? Yeah. You know, as, as was mentioned last week, um, the, the swab has about a 30% uh, false negative result. So 30% um, of people who are positive may test negative. And so you can't say for sure that you're not infected or contagious. Now, 
it's possible that people who are negative have less viral counts and that's why they test negative and thereby being less contagious. Uh, but we can't say that they're not contagious. Right. If they're truly negative, meaning if we had a 100% gold standard test, we would say that they're that they are not contagious until they come in contact with someone who potentially reinfects infects them, but we don't have that gold standard test right now. Um, I'd like to move on to discuss a very specific population, uh, one that I'm seeing in my practice, um, and that is the impact of coronavirus in pregnancy. Um, fortunately, to date we have not seen uh, a greater incidence of severe illness in women who are pregnant who get the virus compared with their non-pregnant um, cohorts. Uh, similarly, we have not seen, there are isolated reports that have not been verified. We really haven't seen cases of transmission from mother to fetus in utero. There have been cases of newborns who contract the infection, but that's still to be a result of exposure after delivery. Scientists have looked at uh, uh, both the amniotic fluid and the cord blood, where we can actually get a direct assessment of what's in the infant's bloodstream at birth. And we've not found any evidence of the virus in either of those two locations, in the amniotic fluid or in the cord blood. Uh, at Mount Sinai, where I'm also on faculty, where we do several thousand deliveries a year, uh, we've had a, a large number of women who have screened positive for COVID, but we haven't had any newborns that have been impacted. So I, number one, wanted to get that reassuring word out to the community. Um, we do know that pregnant women in general are at greater risk for viral infection because all pregnant women have a relatively suppressed immune system. But the good news is we haven't seen a higher in incidence of severe disease. Most of the women remain asymptomatic and we, we have not seen any uh, uh, verifiable cases of transmission to the fetus. So. Um, that's obviously uh, very reassuring. And as a result, some of the questions that came in uh, were regarding, should we I'd like to start a family? I'd like to extend my family size. Should we wait until this is over? And from a purely theoretical point of view, we don't see a reason to do that. Our academic bodies haven't canceled that. Of course, it's a personal decision. So many other things go into it, including what's your socioeconomic status? Have you been laid off? Are there financial worries? Uh, is being at home with your other children stressful to you? But from a a purely uh, biological point of view, we don't have to really uh, come out and really anticipate coming out with that information. Um, anything either of you would like to add in regards to that? I think that's a pretty up to date summary uh, based on, on the information we've had from our department. Um, I, would, I would agree. It does seem that the placenta provides a barrier from maternal to fetal transmission. So I think that is reassuring. We, we have seen cases of, of pregnant women who become very ill. So, you know, I guess it's it, it sort of, it's, it's variable, obviously. So it's not 100% that you won't get it if, if you're pregnant or become very ill. But it's, it's, you know, it's one of those factors that we have to think about. Um, you know, I would just say that it, in terms of, uh, you know, starting a family or let's say going through like, you know, IVF treatments, it's, to me, it really is just taking precautions in, in terms of, personal protective equipment, going to a clinic where everybody should be wearing it, washing your hands, being very careful. And those are just the normal precautions that anyone should take. Yeah, you've mentioned the infertility treatments. And in the teaser for the program, I, I touched upon that. So I, I'd like to just, you know, finalize that point. The uh, American, uh, the, uh, the uh, American uh, Reproductive Medicine Society did put a moratorium on infertility treatments at the outset of the pandemic. Uh, but most of that was because there was concern about uh, use of PPEs, did we have adequate number of PPEs, uh, elective, quote unquote, elective surgical procedures were also put on hold. And, and so that was considered a form of elective surgical procedures. But many of the local um, infertility uh, centers, including the IVF centers, are beginning to roll out to reopen their programs, taking, of course, all the precautions that, that you have just mentioned. So that's another reassuring finding, I believe. Um, so, so now this little bit about pregnancy, let's talk about um, another special population, namely children. Um, I'd like to address specifically two points. Uh, there was a very well publicized headline or article in the New York Post that people have been asking me about, asking us about, uh, that stated that young children cannot affect others with COVID. Uh, I need for you to please debunk that statement if you believe it deserves to be debunked. All right. So I would, I would 
caution everyone that, you know, it, it's not a matter of what the source is that, you know, newspapers will publish things. And these, this comes from a, a, a journal study. So it wasn't that this was completely made up. It's pot, I believe they were referring to a, there was an outbreak in Switzerland at a ski lodge and they found that one of the children had the virus and somehow did not infect anyone. And from that, they sort of extrapolated that well, it, it, the kids just don't do this. But that's from a viral biological point of view that doesn't make sense. And there have been cases where children have transmitted it to others. So it's, it's in this disease, there's no way anything can be zero or 100. There's always sort of, you know, variations in gray areas and things, but nothing's ever 100% or zero. Yeah, so the next, uh, go ahead. If, if I could add to just two things is that, you know, it, it, since kids get less disease, you could make an a, a uh, extrapolation, an extrapolation that possibly they, they may shed less because they have less virus. But as, as Dr. Stern said, I, I agree with what he said, that kids are, are, can transmit. You know, I, I think this idea that they can't transmit is something we don't want to start uh, talking about until we have really good data to support that, and we don't have that. Number two is that kids in the first year of life are at increased risk of more severe infection than older kids. So we do have to be more careful with newborns. So I would say if you do have a newborn at home, do try to be more careful about going out and, and, and interacting with other people because if your newborn baby does get sick, then although most of them do very, very well, as you mentioned, you know, from being in a hospital with moms who are test COVID positive, you know, we, we do need to be more careful about them. And we have actually, in our doctors who have newborn babies at home, we've been more careful with them and having them work from home uh, more than, than others. Yeah, you raise an interesting point that, that I um, hadn't necessarily thought to, to bring to the, to the discussion. Uh, what, is a, what does a mother do who's newly who's delivered and born and she's COVID positive, whether she has symptoms or not? There's a bit of uncertainty as to how we ought to handle that. Some uh, academic councils, some institutions are recommending that the mother continue to, to be with her newborn, to continue to bond with the newborn, to nurse the newborn, just uh, to be very, very diligent with wearing a mask and hand washing if they're using a breast pump to make sure to clean it carefully between uses, et cetera, and that we should otherwise uh, encourage engagement between mother and newborn child. Uh, some institutions, uh, not the one that, that we're at, not at Mount Sinai, some other, some other institutions have recommended that mother and child be sequestered independently from one another. Um, as, as we said, some of the things we've discussed, it's a, it's a risk benefit for uh, Not only there is, there is potential benefits, but also some of the uncertainties. But I think the majority opinion seems to be that with careful um, masks, careful washing, that mothers can be together. Yeah, I mean, that means it's also it's possible, possible that the mother is passing antibodies to the breast milk to the baby. So the risk is probably bigger if someone brings home coronavirus to the mom and child simultaneously, than if the mother is infected, then breastfeeds the baby who's recently born, and that baby's receiving some passive immunity. So there's, there's that issue as well. I don't think we know any of the answers yet, and so we do we have to remain careful. Any members of our audience who've read today's paper or watched this evening's evening news are probably anxious about the following question. Um, there are beginning to become, uh, I've been there for a while, I don't know, there are beginning to, uh, to be reports about COVID infections in, in, in children. Um, I want to be very clear to our audience that we promised you last visit, last session, and we'll continue, that will always be factually based. Uh, and, and, and I don't prepare Dr. Salama and Dr. Stern with the questions beforehand. Uh, this is more of a good dialogue. But I did make sure to, rate, to let them know I'd be asking this question in time because I wanted to make sure to do with sensitivity, with, uh, with level-headedness, because it's very easy for us to create a situation of undue panic. So can you please address some of these reports that have come out, particularly in the New York metropolitan area, on the evening, evening paper, in newspapers regarding infections in children? Yeah, I, you know, remember that New York City is a city of almost 10 million people, and we've been hit very, very hard. So we've had hundreds of thousands of cases, many of which have gone undiagnosed, right? And so when you have this many patients, even though the, the, the rate of infection of children is extraordinarily low, when you have this number of a denominator, 
you're going to have some kids who get infected and sick. And when you get some kids who are sick, some of those are going to get very sick. And so there have been some critically ill children admitted to hospitals. That's been reported in other places. This is nothing new. It's just that the percentage of those infections is much lower than it would be for older people. So as you get older in age, obviously the oldest get the sickest and have the most infections and, 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 and all on down to the children who get the least number of infections. So yes, infections and critical illness can occur in children. It's just thankfully extraordinarily uncommon. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, the big question that are on, that's on people's minds, we saw it this past weekend as the weather began to turn warm, and as people are now going to week eight or week nine of staying at home, is the summer. And we touched very briefly on it this past uh, session. Um, I know each of you working on the front lines against this pandemic have brought your own approach to how you're dealing with your own family. So if you're comfortable doing so, can you share with us, please, each of you, what you've been doing in terms of being with family, coming home, not coming home, how to approach that. And then we'll move forward from that into some perhaps precise recommendations that we can make regarding summertime, family merging, et cetera. Well, I, I mean, I think every doctor that I know and every healthcare worker I know will, they'll get home and they'll essentially bleach down, bleach wipe their, their uh, cell phone, their beepers, if they have a beeper, their keys, and then they take a shower and they, they wash their hair and take the clothes that they're wearing and put them in a, in, a, in a separate bag. So we take those precautions, but that in a sense, that's really not enough for our household contacts. And so many people who've been in frequent and close and constant contact with sick patients have essentially sent their families away in a sense, sort of self-quarantined and, and self-isolated in order to basically take the risk to zero for the people we love. And I, you know, I understand it's, it's unrealistic to expect that of everybody. And, but for, if you want to make the risk zero, that's what I, that's what I've chosen to do. And that's, and, you know, Carlos can speak for him, himself on that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, my family went away when this started, actually a week before this all started, we were thinking ahead and my wife and kids uh, left the metropolitan area. They, they're now in North Carolina and, uh, and, so for six weeks, I, we stayed completely apart from each other. Like Aaron said, I also do the same thing. I clean myself off and clean everything I take with me out of work. I come home, I take a shower. Um, and, and so my, my home is a clean space and I don't wear a mask at home and people don't need to wear masks inside the house unless they're trying to separate from other people. So if you live alone or you have no exposure and you stay in the house, you and whoever's in that house is clean, right? You, you, can, you can all be in that house uh, without a mask on if, if you're all you know, in the same situation. So uh, now, the important thing to realize here is that not everybody has the financial ability to do this, this separation, right? So um, you know, a lot of people have to be together. They, they have to go to work and then come home. And if they're doing that, then that's a completely different situation. So if you're an essential worker, and you have to stay at home with somebody, well then, you know, separation, distancing, uh, masking is an, going to be an important thing. I did go to visit my family last weekend and I did um, um, get tested the morning I left. And while I was there, I socially distanced, wore a mask the entire time, slept in a separate room, and I was extremely careful to try to avoid it. Studies have shown that in the same household, social distancing, and mask wearing does work and does prevent transmission. So that's an important takeaway from all this, that if you do need to spend time and you one person does have an exposure risk while others don't, then social distancing does work. How and as long- a, as a, as a, Sorry, as a counter argument, to, or as a, an agreement with that, the highest rates of transmission are within families, close contact and lo spending lots of time together. Those are clearly the highest rates of infection. Right. And those rates have clearly come down now as we have social distance as a society. So as we've all gone through into our homes, anyone, any home that was clean, that was not infected, those homes have remained that way. And so that's why rates in New York City have dramatically dropped. And we're seeing far fewer admissions now than we did even two weeks ago. So, you know, there is a, uh, there's a, uh, 
an explanation for everything we've been doing and it's been working. Now the question is what's going to happen when we open up? So realistically speaking, I think a large segment of this community does plan to gather for the summer and merge grandparents, children, and grandchildren. What I think I'm hearing from you, and I want to try to provide some clarity for the audience is, while that is not the ideal situation, we have, we have a concept of, of, of lechat chila and bidiyavad in halakha, where this is truly the best way to, to keep the halakha, but in certain circumstances, this is the second best way. What I believe I'm hearing from you is, if you're not going to stay separate, listen, Seder night, I, don't, I frankly don't know anybody who merged families. I know people who had said they're just with their wives. I know young couples who had it alone, young families, just the parents and the children. I don't know anyone they got together. I'm being honest when they say, while we're not condoning it, I don't know how realistic that will be summertime. I think what I'm hearing from both of you is, if you're going to merge families, still maintain the social distancing that we've been taught until now. Is that a fair summary statement? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, absolutely too. And, and, and with the notion of we don't know how long after exposure you shed virus. And that's an important point because people are saying seven days, people are saying two weeks. This is a bell curve. There are some people who shed for seven days, some people shed for six weeks. And we just don't know. So this idea that after two weeks we don't have to social distance anymore may not actually prove true and may increase risk in the summer when people start to get together again. I'd also say extra precautions should be, you know, thought of for the elderly, people with a lot of chronic medical conditions, people who have, are immunosuppressed for organ transplants or have had cancer and are on chemotherapy. These are probably the most at-risk groups. And if you're going to take precautions and be careful, these are the groups you have to be absolutely 100%. These are your loved ones. And these are the people you really want to take care of and think about. On the topic of summer, um, can you comment, please, on some of the, well, at least hopeful um, comments that some have made about a seasonal nature to this, that as the weather gets warmer, we may see a downtick in the degree of transmission. I know we don't, haven't lived through a season of COVID, of the coronavirus, to be able to see so with certainty, but uh, might that be a glimmer of hope for the upcoming summer season? Yeah, you know, it, it, these are all speculations. You know, a lot of COVID uh, information is speculation. How many will die? Well, we think 100,000. I think of 200,000. Will the summer make things better? Yes, no, maybe a little. We don't know. Uh, most people think that may have a minimal effect uh, on this virus's transmission, but the fact is that we just don't know. And I would assume that everything will stay the same until we see this thing pretty much gone. And I would remain very, very careful. As Aaron said, you know, none of us want to be responsible for making someone in our family sick, especially someone who's older and who may get really, really sick. So be really careful. Don't count on the summer making this thing go away. Concerns about transmission in swimming pools? We, we don't know, but chlorine tends to kill most things. Um, you know, obviously what's in your body is not killed by chlorine. So if you're in a swimming pool and you're coughing, well, you need to still social distance, right? So if someone is in a pool and is a foot away from you and coughs in your face, you're going to get coronavirus uh, if they have it. So be smart, uh, you know, and, and don't think that going in a pool where someone was in a pool is going to be a risk from the water. That's not the way. But commingling with people in that same pool at the same time, that's the risk. You know, so I'm thinking a lot of the questions we're discussing um, are important to people and they've been getting information from various sources. And, and one of the persistent themes that are coming through in the questions are, it's difficult to know, particularly in today's heavily politicized social media world, what sources we can trust. If you have any uh, sources that are not specifically geared toward healthcare professionals that the public may be able to turn to for some accurate, accurate up-to-date information, acknowledging the uncertainty um, um, I would, you know, I would say that it's, things are obviously filtered through the media, but when you're looking at large academic medical centers that are well-respected, that are doing very, you know, first-rate research, you know, places on, you know, the East Coast and some, and, you know, in this country, as well as other parts of the world, those are often very good sources. And then 
you know, if the source of a journal is something like the New England Journal or Lancet, um, you know, very reputable uh, publications, those are things that are generally rigorous, more rigorously reviewed and, um, you know, considered before they're being published and disseminated. So those are things that we look at. Yeah, cdc.gov is also a nice place where people can go and just get, they have, they have things written for patients and for doctors. And the things written for patients are explained in a very non-medical way and easy for people to understand. Uh, thank you. Moving on um, a little bit to treatment. We spoke briefly last session about this, the plasma um, transfusions and about the remdesivir. Um, someone asked a question, and in fact, someone I ran to on the street the other day asked me if I knew how they could access stem cell therapy, Pluristem. Have either of you employed that treatment? Uh, if so, please tell us your experience, and if not, can you share with us what the theory behind it is and, and whether that's actually a potential viable treatment option? Pluristem is, a, is an Israeli company uh, that uses placenta-derived stem cells to target virus, specific viruses. And as far as I know, the only, it's been used in Israel in very sick people with supposedly good success. And the only hospital here that's using it, as far as I know, is Holy Name Hospital in Northern New Jersey. Uh, I read about that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but that's, like, that's a hopeful treatment that's in the very early stages. Uh, plasma transfusion, um, there is no uh, uh, placebo-controlled trials out yet. Uh, regarding the efficacy of plasma uh, transfusion, but you know, plasma transfusion is is a treatment that's been utilized for for decades uh, to treat all different kinds of diseases. You know, in the pre-antibiotic era, for example, people used uh, antibody neutralizing antibody to treat people. So we think that it's something that would be a useful treatment, but we just don't have the data to support it right now. We are using it a lot in our hospital. Uh, because we think it's one of the more viable treatments. And the risk to the donor with plasma donations? No, there's no risk. The raise and it's, there should be no risk. Yeah. Right. And your, your body continually makes antibodies. So it's not that it, it's, you're going to run out. You, it, you replenish it. The body, it's sort of a constantly being turned on at that, at, from once you've had the disease and you've, you've uh, eliminated the virus. I want to once again point out what we mentioned at the outset of tonight's session. A lot of the questions that have come in, and thank you all for sending them. Uh, I may not be reading your question verbatim per script, but the discussions that we've been having with Dr. Salama and Dr. Stern are answering the overwhelming majority of questions that have come in. So again, if we haven't quoted your question per se, please remain attentive, and, and I'm sure we've answered most, if not all, the questions that are coming through the panel. Um, Okay, and the same with some mode patients is an increased risk of blood clots. Uh, and some of the questions that have come in um, have come in from people who already have some predisposition to blood clots due to some mutation. Someone called in that they have a factor five mutation. I don't want to bore the audience with the technical details, but I just want those folks to know we're addressing your your questions. Um, can you comment on that finding and and Questions came in, should I be taking aspirin if I have COVID? Should I be taking blood thinners if I have COVID? Um, what's the role of the whole, uh, what we call hypercoagulability, which basically is a fancy medical word stating a, 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 a tendency in, in, in your bloodstream? So, so, at this, so at this point, in terms of treatment, uh, we, a lot of, we are seeing a lot of uh, blood clots in areas that we wouldn't necessarily expect. And they've actually been quite devastating for a lot of patients. So we have a lot of patients who we've started on what we call therapeutic anticoagulation to really try to block it. And we're, it's not yet clear whether that's having an effect. If you then look back and say, well, are people who are on anticoagulation for things like blood clots in the past or atrial fibrillation, and a lot of people are on agents to stop uh, strokes, we're not yet seeing, are those patients protected? Is that a protective benefit or is there some benefit? I, this virus is so overwhelming that, you know, the chances are that probably not. I mean, it just seems like all comers are getting it. And many people are on aspirin and doesn't seem to change the fact that they, those patients are also getting it. So it's, it's too early to say whether taking those drugs are protective or having a genetic uh, uh, a defect that would have you being prone to blood clots is somehow making you more at risk. We just don't know yet. We, there's a huge amount of data that will take, you know, a long time to sort through until we really have answers. 
So Dr. Stern, having trained as a kidney specialist, um, we know that the virus can impact other organs. And there have been um, uh, quite a bit of information about the impact uh, on the kidneys and that a lot of COVID patients who are hospitalized and ill require dialysis. Uh, is there a shortage of dialysis machines? And can you just give us your general impression of the association between COVID and kidney failure? So when patients with uh, COVID-19 become critically ill, we are seeing many patients, a very large percentage, go into kidney failure. And that means the kidneys shut down, they stop making urine, and they require a process to clean their blood, which is dialysis. So we, you know, they require emergency dialysis, and that can happen several times a week in order to, to save them. Because so many patients were getting sick and so many requiring dialysis in the New York metropolitan area, although many parts of the country and even in the world are seeing this, there was not enough equipment. And there, it's a very complicated procedure that requires a lot of different um, things to, to have it happen. Because we're slowing down now, we're now able to provide it. We were always able to provide it. It was just very, very close. And we had to call different companies and get all the equipment that we needed. But that's now not an issue. Um, but it clearly is a risk for patients with this in terms of just being critically ill and having organs shut down. Thank you. Um, you along the lines of equipment availability, a very interesting question that came in was, um, being that both of you are treating patients in the hospital with this disease, uh, the question that came in was, um, are you finding that patients are being treated differently because of the resources? We, we've, we've heard some rumors that have you had any personal experience with that, uh, that potential problem? Ventilator lack, uh, dialysis machines, critical um, care? I, you know, honestly, I would say it got, certainly got close at times. It, we were able to get what we needed, but it definitely was, there were a lot of panic buttons being pushed uh, for several weeks where it looked, it was, it was bad. I mean, it really was, uh, as they say, it was a, a tidal wave that, hit and you know hospitals can deal with all kinds of problems when it happens all at once and you have hundreds and hundreds of patients coming into you every single day you're it you have to scramble and that's really what was happening i'm going to ask a couple of unfair questions but it's really taking up a significant number of the questions that are coming through in the midst of this of this webinar and it's i'm hesitant to ask it because it involves a little bit of conjecture so uh I think we need to be clear that anything that's stated in response to this question is just opinion. Uh, we've always tried to be a factually based session. And people are asking a lot of questions, understandably so, about camp. Uh, I'm not asking you to predict whether they'll be open or whether they won't be open, but perhaps we can have a bit of a dialogue regarding the pros and cons, um, what the parameters may be that we need to follow uh, before they're opened and what, what uh, Precautions may need to be taken if they are in fact opened. Unfair question, please forgive me. I, I think it's, it's all it's all over the, the question and answer session. Uh, I, I think it's extremely unlikely there's going to be camp this summer for kids. Um, I, you know, we just has, lost half our audience. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think institutions that run camps are gonna to have to look at the big picture here and say, hey, you know, what is what is a chance that transmission is gonna spread in this camp? And then all these kids are going to take those infections back to their parents and grandparents. And when you take that into account, uh, these institutions are going to be reluctant and understandably so to put families at risk like that, not to mention their employees, employees that work for them. I, you know, I, I think this summer, unfortunately, it's going to be given the fact that we're so close to it right now, it's going to be very, very difficult. Now, things may change very rapidly. There may be a lot of data to come out, you know, and that, you know, infection rates are way down and blah, blah, blah. I don't think that's going to happen. And with all the states opening up now, I think uh, the opposite may happen, that we may get more infections. And so I, I think, uh, unfortunately, I'm not very um, uh, high on camp opening this summer. And I assume you would probably have a similar opinion regarding potential opening of the synagogues. Yeah, synagogues. Same idea. Yeah, churches, mosques. I think they're all going to remain closed for the foreseeable future. Any place where people congregate, uh, I think right now. I mean, it's one thing to open the cities up to business 
and allow limited business in stores, but to then, you know, tell people, come, come to camp, come to school, come to whatever, you know, opening camp is like saying, you know, we can have school in June and, and we cannot have school in June. So I think all those things go together. And I think right now, institutions, governments, localities are going to be very reluctant to put large people at risk by congregating large amounts of people. Looking at another question, just to show you how quickly this is, is, is evolving in, in the state of flux that we're in and the, and the degree of uncertainty that we have. Someone's asking me, why have you not mentioned hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax? That was headlined three, four weeks ago. Well, you know, hydroxychloroquine uh, and azithromycin were two antibiotics that were felt to be effective based mainly on in vitro data. Meaning, what does that mean? That means when you look in a test tube, the, the medications tend to somehow prevent the virus from replicating. Uh, but studies in humans uh, has not well, first of all, not many studies have been done, but we haven't seen these drugs be extremely effective at decreasing death in people coming to the hospital. For example, at Elmhurst, everybody who came in in April and May got hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin up until recently. And we had, unfortunately, a lot of bad outcomes. And we, don't, we, don't, we didn't get the sense that those drugs were very, very effective. And so until there's a prospect, we, we've now gotten more... Um, you know, measured in what we do. And until there's a prospective study to show that hydroxychloroquine or uh, azithromycin are effective in humans versus placebo, meaning sugar pills, then I think there's not going to be a lot of enthusiasm about those drugs. Are they still being used? Well, uh, certainly I think hydroxychloroquine is still being used, but the combination has really fallen out of sur a favor because of increased risk for cardiac toxicity. Um, so, I think that's the reason why we're not talking about it so much. Uh, her, the concept of herd immunity is something we hear about a lot um, when listening to reports about coronavirus. Can you explain the concept of herd immunity to audience and why it's relevant to this discussion and uh, how it's specifically applicable to the COVID epidemic? Is, is, herd immunity is the following. Um, when, when you have a new virus and everybody is susceptible, everyone you come in contact with is, is potentially going to become infected. When 75, 80, 85 percent of the population has already been exposed and already has immunity, most of the people that you come in contact with cannot propagate the virus to other people. And therefore, there is what we call herd immunity, meaning you may have it, but you won't then transmit it to someone else. So if you don't have it, someone is less likely to transmit it to you because it can't go from A to B to C to D to you because B, C, and D are already immune. So that's the concept of her immune. There's so many people that are immune that the virus is unlikely to either get to you or get from you to someone else. Any updates on vaccine research? I doubt anything new has happened in the last five days since we originally spoke, but questions are coming through on that as well. I mean, it's, it's it, in a sense, it's almost like the moonshot for for this age. Every every um, country and company that has a stake in this, and we all do, is is actively pursuing it. And you know, it's it's clearly going to be the thing that may not be a game changer, but I think will really help quite a bit. It's unclear whether how effective it will be because it doesn't exist yet. It's being you know things are being tested, and you know we're making sure that they're safe and. You know, we'll have to see if, if whatever comes out is effective. And in the end, it may be a combination of medication and antiviral medication and antibody therapy and vaccine therapy. So we may be able to tackle this um, with, with those weapons. But I still say social distancing and, and, and personal, you know, hand washing, things like that are really still going to be important no matter what, what happens until we get more of a handle on it. I think last week I mentioned that the fastest vaccine ever was made in four years. It was a mumps vaccine. Having said that, never before has the world tried so hard to create a vaccine so quickly. And I'm very, very hopeful that a vaccine will be available by, by the winter. Um, the Oxford University company uh, a group that's putting a vaccine that's already started trials is, is even saying in the fall they may have a vaccine. 
So that, I, I, you know, I, I think given what the world is going through and given the amount of money people are willing to throw at this right now, I'm very, very hopeful that a vaccine will be available by next winter. There's also just today announced that a, that a Dutch company developed a monoclonal antibody directed against this virus. So that's going to be another potential medication to be used. So there's a lot of hopeful stuff out there. And, you know, I, I do think this is, we're going to go through a tough few months, but I think there's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel, you know, in, in the next six months. I want to double back and just comment as I'm looking through more questions that have come in. So many of the questions are asking for some uh, opinion on a permutation or combination of, of testing. And if I tested positive and someone tested negative or vice versa, and all the possibilities as to whether we can, we can socially congregate. I think in answer to all of those questions, we've answered them previously and, and it's important to reiterate that we really at this point don't have the experience or the confidence to rely on any particular set of testing to allow us to green light re-engaging. And that if you are going to engage with others, as per your choice and your own risk benefit ratio that you continue as much as possible to follow the guidelines the social distancing guidelines, the wearing of masks and the washing of hands. So, um, uh, as I said, so many of the questions are dealing with those combinations. If my grandparents had it or I had it or vice versa, what do we do with that? And this isn't math. You know, this isn't, this isn't, uh, equa th these are not equations. We can't plug them into a nomogram and come up with an answer. It's the concept that I think that's important. And that is we still don't yet know enough to be able to give specific advice about those kinds of things. So best to be cautious and best to follow the, the, the social distancing. Um, last session, I asked that we um, end with some sort of uh, honest, factually based, but hopeful assessment. Dr. Slama, you raised some of that already in your expectation that a vaccine will probably be available prior or faster than any other vaccine in, in the history of humankind, in medical history. Um, any other thoughts that we can leave our audience with in terms of sense of hope and a sense of optimism? Yeah, I think that um, on two fronts, A, that the, the people who make vaccines, the virologists in the labs, these are some of the brightest people on earth. Um, and so, you know, we don't even know yet that we'll be able to make a vaccine for this thing, but it's looking increasingly likely that we are and that these are very, very, very bright people. Uh, and, and with the right kind of funding, I think that a vaccine is, is on the horizon. In addition to that, we knew nothing about this virus, how to treat it um, when, when, when it first started in New York. Like Aaron and I, we were like, you know, there wasn't that much, you know, the, the idea that blood clots kill people with this disease wasn't really figured out until the New York ec epidemic. Uh, it wasn't really published a lot from China or from Europe. So we have learned a tremendous amount. The, Pete, we're going to, as, as, as medical field, is going to learn a tremendous amount about this virus and how to treat it. New medications are going to become available. You know, the, 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 the movement in medicine is very fast these days. And so I'm extremely hopeful that things will get better. Now, this is all supposed upon the fact that pe people are going to continue to socially distance. You know, if we start throwing it all away and, you know, start going out every time 75 degrees outside, then we're going to have a big problem on our hands. So assuming we continue to social distance, assuming that we continue to be smart about our choices and our decisions, I think that eventually uh, we, we will get control of this because we're learning a lot and there's a lot of, uh, of, of funding going into this right now. Yeah, I think a great example is that is in our department in obstetrics and gynecology, uh, once we began to become aware of the risks of clots, uh, we also had been aware for some time that pregnant women just by virtue of being pregnant or just having had a baby or at risk for clots. So if we have a woman who tests positive for COVID who is pregnant or uh, primarily those who've just delivered, we're actually treating them with blood thinners uh, in an effort to prevent some of that clot formation. So I think that's a very uh, uh, definitive palpable example about something that we had no awareness of because it's a new disease that we rather rapidly uh, noticed that that trend was developing and jumped on it in terms of a therapy that we know uh, can be helpful and undoubtedly has helped uh, people prevent more serious illness. So I would agree with you on that term, on that count. You know, to the audience, it may seem like 
uh, the medical profession is flying by the seat of its pants. But I think it's important to understand that there's some very bright, extraordinarily gifted people who are working tirelessly, um, responsive to the developments, and being very, um, very uh, capable of uh, changing direction when new information comes out. I think we're far ahead of where we were uh, seven or eight weeks ago in terms of our understanding of this disease, despite the fact that we don't yet have a definitively proven therapy or vaccine. Dr. Stern, as someone who's, on, who's in the ICU on a daily basis, um, again, trying to get from you a sense of some optimism based in, based in, in, in fact, um, can you please just share with us your experience at the peak of the number of admissions, hospitalizations, intubations, et cetera, all the parameters that the governor follows and reports to us in his daily briefings and where, you are, where we are now. Clearly, uh, there's still, it's still a serious condition. We still have a census full of patients, but I think it will be help, helpful to us to see that progress has been made on the front lines uh, in terms of what you're seeing day to day. Well, I can, I can say that the hospital has taken a, a palpable, uh, has a palpable sense of relief that the numbers really are down and that we, as they say, is, you know, we really have flattened the curve in New York. Every hospital is now reporting every day there's sort of a 4% drop in, in, in patients who are being treated for COVID and we're having discharges every day and patients are getting better. There's still some very sick patients and uh, they're still critically ill, but the number of who are coming into the ER is dramatically decreased and it's been, it's been, you know, now manageable. We're now able to, to see and treat patients, whereas before it was just, you know, we, we were having doctors and nurses and, and people from all over the country flying into the New York City to, to help us. And it, it was, we, would, we wouldn't have made it without them. And so we owe a huge debt of gratitude to everyone who came in and helped. And of course, if it hits other parts of the country, which it will, um, we're, you know, we're willing to do that too. And it really shows the sort of that sense of, um, you know, of, of, the help that we want to give each other. So that's from a healthcare perspective, that's what we're seeing. Things are definitely better right now in New York. I think that's wonderful and it's reassuring and it gives me another opportunity at the risk of being redundant to remind the audience, please, um, if you or a loved one is experiencing serious symptoms of any kind, you must reach out to your physician or to the local hospital or to Hatsala or whatever appropriate bridge to healthcare is, please do not hesitate to seek medical care for, non, for a serious non-COVID related illness. The hospitals have the ability to treat you. They have the capability of addressing your concerns. Um, and um, that's, a, you know, if, I, if we were to repeat that message every 10 minutes, I don't think we'd be, we'd be getting it out frequently enough. So please, I, I, I plead with all of you, don't ignore serious symptoms, chest pain, facial numbness, drooping of the face, signs of stroke, even things like, uh, you know, during this pandemic, people are going to continue to have appendicitis attacks. They're going to continue to have kidney stones. And all the things, all the human maladies that we've been treating in hospitals uh, since time, you know, uh, in, memorial, in memoriam is, are still ongoing. And I know some folks are hesitant to seek care because of that. And that's a dangerous thing. And, and particularly now that the volume in the hospital seems to be more manageable. It's important now more than ever for us to get that message out. Right. So I want to reiterate, I can assure you that in the last two weeks, every hospital in New York has now scrubbed, cleansed, sterilized parts of their wards as well as their emergency rooms. So you have now dedicated areas of the emergency room for patients who are non-COVID to come in and get these things treated, as, uh, as, as Victor said. Yeah. And in fact, on our labor floor, well, there was a time where in my patient population, we were running a, 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 about two-thirds of 75% COVID positive patients. And the majority of our staff hasn't become sick. And fortunately, those that did have, have all recovered. We haven't had any serious illness. So if we're working in a unit where we know that a significant number of people at the time were COVID positive, and we've come through it with proper precautions, use of PPE and face masks and, 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 and uh, uh, disinfecting uh, surfaces and careful hand washing, if we haven't, and if Dr. Salama and Dr. Stern, who, who are in the ICUs, haven't contracted it. As a patient who needs medical care, I, I think that ought to, to hopefully convince you that seeking medical care when necessary remains appropriate. Um, again, I apologize to those whose questions we didn't specific an specifically answer, though I believe we got through virtually all of them in one form or another. Uh, in the few remaining moments, I'd like to please turn the, uh, the uh, session over to Jack Aney, uh, who is the president of Sephardic Bikor Halim. I'd like to thank uh, the UJA for giving us another opportunity to meet with all of you and, of course, to our expert panelists. 
uh, yeah, Dr. Yeah. Aaron Stern and Dr. Carlos Salama. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, please stay safe. Please get some rest. We need you. We love you. And uh, Jack Ganey, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Grazi, Dr. Salama, Dr. Stern. That was a really informative session and you covered so much ground. Uh, we appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to help our community stay informed and stay safe. Uh, before we close out the program, I'd like to thank uh, Mindy and her entire team for organizing this program and to the entire UJA Federation for their support in providing SBH with targeted grants to assist single parent homes and seniors impacted by COVID and for the general support of all our schools, our organizations, our schools and everything that they do uh, all year round, every year. Uh, I'd like to also thank Sephardic Community Center for their uh, partnership and for all they do for the community. Uh, also to the Sephardic Community Alliance for their partnership uh, for organizing our community doctor group, our unbelievable doctor group uh, that's been very active during this crisis and uh, for their general support of the community as well. Uh, finally, thank you to my unbelievable team at SBH. Uh, people have been working diligently around the clock on all fronts to help everyone cope and deal with the crisis. Uh, special thanks to our MedStar team and to Nancy Sutton in particular uh, for all their assistance on the medical front. To all of our listeners, let's, let's continue to pray for a quick end to this crisis and for our ability to get back to normalcy. In the meantime, be safe, be well, and thank you for joining us. Good night. <laughs>